Don't you love that uh, passage in, in uh, Ephesians? Can you imagine when that letter arrived, they unrolled it, and maybe being read by the light of an oil lamp and everybody's gathered together, and they hear this wonderful confirmation of the gospel, and everyone's hearts must have been stirred and because it's just uh, so eloquently uh, uh, points out that it is all him. It's all the Lord doing it. And uh, his grace and kindness to bring us into the family, this filthy people, uh, uh, laden with sin and uh, corruption, to be made clean by the sacrifice of his son to be washed clean by his blood and brought into the family. It's, it's, it is unbelievable. And uh, it's a wonderful to believe in it, to have had the quickening of the Holy Spirit to bring us to this faith and, and dependency on this thing. Despite everything around us distracting us and and all of the resistance that goes on inside us as well, that he brought us to this point where in, we're, f we're firm, we're saved. So uh, I uh, took up one break for a Christmas message last a week, and we're back to Acts again, okay? So gird yourself yourselves and get ready and uh, we're in uh, Acts uh, chapter 18 uh, starting with verse 18 and uh, I use this as the uh, epilogue uh, of last that message uh, two weeks ago and, and now I'm using it as the prologue to this message because I'm actually going to go back into a little bit of the first part of 18 after this, Paul stayed many days longer and then took leave of the brothers and set sail for Syria. So, in other words, after this, uh, um, after this disturbance uh, before Gallio, where the Jews had, uh, had uh, taken him uh, before the, the Roman proconsul and accused him of sedition, basically. Uh, Gallio uh, had uh, nothing, would have nothing to do with it. And in fact, in dismissing uh, the leader of the synagogue, uh, who presumably, uh, because it was, had, they had to be driven out, he resisted, Sothenes resisted the dismissal of the proconsul. Sothenes was beaten by the uh, security, the, the court security. So instead of Paul getting beaten, which usually is what happened, Paul and uh, his uh, fellows, uh, it was the accusers who were beaten this time. And if we remember in uh, the, pre in the uh, verse uh, 9, it said, uh, the Lord, in verse 9 of 18, it said, the Lord said to Paul one night in the vision, do not be afraid, but go on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you or harm you, for I have many in this city who are peop my people. Now, so th the Lord told him, you're not going to get, uh, you're not going to get beaten up this time or driven out of the place. However, as we see what happened with Gale Galio, we see that that was not for the want of opposition. There was opposition. Okay, he hadn't eradicated the people or, or had muffled the people who uh, were opposed to Paul's teaching, opposed to the gospel. So what I'm getting, I'm I'm getting you to a place here, and me too. So uh, God can stop the results of persecution. He is sovereign over this. So that leaves us with the perhaps the uncomfortable truth is that when we do suffer persecution, he is essentially allowing it to happen because he can stop it where he stopped it here. 
And so this surely educates us into the value of persecution, that it is an instrument that he allows, that, you, that he makes use of, okay? He makes use of persecution because it has purpose. It has purpose for good and also for bad, of course. But it is, first of all, a winnowing force against the church. It will, I'm afraid, separate the wheat from the chaff, or the wheat from the tares, as it were. And not only a winnowing force for the church itself, but for those who may be interested in the church. I worked uh, with a guy who uh, had two kids, um, and uh, he knew that I was a uh, believer because I, I, I had a Bible study there at uh, that company. And uh, he told me one day, he said, uh, we went to church. And I said, oh, good. He said, yeah. And I said, how did you find it? He said, it was okay, but the kids had a wonderful time. So now, they had young children, and uh, one of the things they liked to do, they, I think while, we, while I worked with him, I think he went three times to Disney World, okay? And, uh, you, you know, once is enough for anybody, surely. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was almost too much. But, <laughs> um, but uh, here was the key. The thing is that the, the, children, the children loved it, okay? They became uh, very excited. Um, and they, 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 a focus of their existence was that their children would have a great time, that their children would have a wonderful childhood full of excitement and imagination and stuff like this. Well, I can assure you that my parents weren't in the least bit interested <laughs> in me having an exciting, imagine-filled life. I was told children uh, should be seen but not heard. <laughs> and I imagine some of you had uh, that rapidly disappearing uh, upbringing uh, that uh, actually fits you for life. <laughs> okay. So, so they, um, they, they were pleased because the children had a good time. And of course, we all know that, uh, that this goes on. And uh, so, the following week, he said, we went away again. I said, good. I didn't, uh, I, I knew this, this place would surely, they surely would preach the gospel in some form to the adults. I, I knew that would happen. It wasn't, it wasn't uh, one of the really dreadful places. Uh, but uh, seven or eight weeks later, I asked him, uh, are you still going? And he said, no. So it didn't really work. But if uh, there was a danger of him being arrested or losing his job to go to that church, I can assure you he would not have gone. And it uh, also has the, the effect of properly contrasting the truth uh, the truth of Christ as opposed to the lies of the world. Uh, we're told that we should have uh, no fellowship or as it were, no love of the world. If we love the world, we don't love God. There's, there's just no compromise between the two. But in this, and persecution has the, has the valuable effect of defining that absolutely. A, 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 an evidential de definition of the enmity which is between the truth and the lies, the truth of Christ and the lies of the world. And so we see that God has used it everywhere. He, if he can prevent it or he can has stop it like he did here, he can stop it anywhere, but he does not. 
and he, put, he, he uses it for his purposes. And so, as we expect our future to become darker in this regard uh, in our nation, uh, it's a good thing for us to remember that uh, it's for his purpose. So uh, Paul uh, has uh, completed a long-term mission uh, in Corinth. This, was, this has been a change from uh, the, uh, the first, um, his first missionary journey and, and for much of his second missionary journey, this has, this has been a change. Uh, he uh, has had a long spell uh, at uh, Antioch. I'm sorry, at, uh, at uh, uh, Corinth. His long spell at Corinth, and now he's uh, going to leave. And the first uh, point here is that he's, going to, he's taking Priscilla and Aquila with him. And these are the people he met in Corinth, the Jews who had been uh, banished from Rome by uh, uh, Claudius, the Emperor Claudius, and uh, they are tent makers, and uh, they uh, are actually leaving with him because he is going to go to uh, Ephesus. And so not only have, obviously they have come to know Christ, uh, they have responded to the gospel, they have they've been, been saved, but now they're willing to leave uh, an established uh, operation behind and join him uh, in wherever he's going. So uh, a great deal of trust must have developed between them, and also a trust of God. Also, this is the first time we see uh, Priscilla uh, mentioned first, and we'll get to that a little bit later in this message. So I imagine that uh, if you, if you, uh, if you will permit a little editorializing, uh, I imagine that when you show up in a new city as a tent maker, you know they're not all lined up saying "Thank goodness, as a tent maker showed up." Okay, I mean the likelihood is that the market is already being reasonably taken care of, and so what happens is that now you have to prove yourself. First of all, you're probably going to have to lower your prices. You're going to have to increase your turnaround. And you're probably going to have to deal with the people who have bad credit. That's how you start a business, okay, in, in an establishment. I mean, I'm, uh, I, I, could, I could be wrong. Uh, I don't know that I'm really going to try and find them when I get to heaven because I won't be interested anymore. But at any rate, that's, that's how it usually happens, okay? Until you, your quality is, is established and then you start to get business from people who are serious and sane and pay their bills. And, then, and, now, and now, only a couple of years later, you're going to leave it all behind again. And so, to me, this is impressive. This is really impressive of the relationship, not only that they have with Paul, but their commitment to, commitment to Christ. And, and, and it's wonderful. And, and so I want to, I want to read uh, from Luke 12. Luke chapter 12. And, of course, this, is not, this, this document is not available at this time, but the... But the but the uh, truth is available about this, and it's uh, verse 22. He said, now he's just, he's just talked about uh, the acknowledging of him. He's saying, if, if, uh, you, if you don't acknowledge me before men, I'm not going to acknowledge you in heaven. Get it, guys. Okay. And, but he's saying, and you know, he has, he has the right to demand that not just because of who he is, but because of what he promises. He has the right to do that because in verse 22 he says, And he said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. The life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens, they neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn, and your God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? 
And which of you will be, by being anxious, can add a single hour to the span of life? If then you are not able to do this small thing as that, why are you anxious about the rest? And of course he goes on to tell them, God is going to take care of your needs. This is terribly, very, very important. It's vital. Because look at all of the cooperation that is going on in our societies, in Western societies, right now, for this colossal lie, or colossal lies, period, uh, uh, plural. The colossal lies that are being told about uh, epidemics and so forth, and uh, the, the remedies and so forth, the results of what is happening to people, no one wants to talk because everybody knows that you're going to lose your job, you're going to lose your house, you're going to maybe even, there's a guy in New Zealand who is, he's now arrested, faces a jail sentence. God takes away all of these fears. We don't need to worry. We may, we may not be as comfy as we are right now, but we're not going to be left destitute. He will take care of it, guaranteed. That's why he's allowed to say, you have to declare me in front of men. You, even if you have to choke it out, you're going to have to do it. Otherwise, I'll deny you, and none of us want that. But he will supply our needs. We get thrown out of our houses. We get thrown out of our workplaces. God will not desert us. So I think that Priscilla and Aquila have that same have that same conviction, that on the same not conviction, that same understanding and conviction of of what the Lord will do. And this has obviously been built up in their relationship with uh, Paul and the Holy Spirit, of course. At uh, Centuria, by the way, all pronunciations are going to be Anglo-American syllables by syllable, okay? <laughs> so if you know the Strong's or something like that, forget it, <laughs> all right? <laughs> Centuria, this is, the, this is the actual port at the end of the channel, well, it's the channel now, but the end of the, the portage uh, part of Corinth. Corinth is on the, on the west coast uh, of, uh, of this isthmus, and uh, Centuria is, the, is the, the port. He says he has haircut under a vow, he's under a vow. Now, some people have said that this is a killer getting his hair cut, but that's, this, I don't believe it, because, of course, it's Paul who's getting all of the, uh, all of the personal pronouns here. Uh, Achilla is not getting a personal pronoun. So at the century, he had his hair cut, for he was under a vow. Okay, and, and it says in chapter, verse 19, and they came to Ephesus, and he left them there, but he himself went into the city. Okay, it's all Paul getting the personal pronouns, not Aquila. Okay. So now, he's getting his hair cut, shaved. He's being shaved, like a Nazarite uh, vow. Go to uh, Numbers, chapter 6. We're not going to read the whole thing, but uh, because it's 21 verses. Numbers, chapter 6. Verse 1. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When either a man or a woman makes a special vow, the vow of a Nazarite, to separate himself to the Lord, he shall separate himself from wine and strong drink. He shall drink no vinegar made from wine or strong drink. He shall drink, not drink any juice of grapes or eat grapes fresh or dried. All the days of his separation, he shall eat nothing that is produced by a grapevine, not even the seeds. All the days of this vow of separation, no razor shall touch his head until the time it is completed, for he separates himself. So it's like a Nazarite vow, but I, 
not sure that it follows through all the way through, he would actually have to uh, go to the temple to sacrifice two lambs. It's, very, it's a very elaborate uh, business. I'm not sure uh, how far he took it. But I am thinking, that because where we'd go with this is that he does wind up in Jerusalem, and in some translations it is mentioning that he is going to attend a feast. I believe he is going to attend this feast. I think that it's probably the Passover. But uh, we don't have confirmation of that. And he is, uh, and, and also, he's been, in, he's been in Corinth for 18 months, and we have no record of him going to Jerusalem for the feast, so he's missed six, at least six feasts. So he's, he's probably anxious to get to one of the feasts. But again, this is speculation. It doesn't, it doesn't thoroughly uh, change the meaning of everything that's going on. And they came to Ephesus, and he left them, but he himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. So in other words, the plan is for Priscilla and Aquila to be left in Ephesus, and <clears throat> he reasons in the synagogue, and then they said, when they asked him to stay for a longer period, he declined. So he has he is headed for he is headed for Jerusalem and actually also Antioch. But he's leaving them behind. But on taking leave of them, he said, I will return to you if God wills. And he set sail for, uh, uh, from Ephesus. So uh, it is his intent to return. In fact, what happens is that uh, Ephesus turns out to be uh, the second of long stays in the city. I think he's at least two years, uh, even more, in Ephesus when he does return, finally, on his uh, third, uh, third journey. Uh, <clears throat> now, when he landed in Caesarea, now, remember, uh, Caesarea is the Roman capital, the, ca the capital of a Roman-occupied uh, Judah, okay? Uh, that so that if the ships would go there uh, to land there. It's still sixty miles odd from uh, Jerusalem. When he landed at Caesarea, he went up and greeted the church. Some translations say that that, that he went to uh, Jerusalem. I believe that in just simply saying he went up to visit the church, he's gone to Jerusalem, because you go up to Jerusalem and everything else around you go down to. Okay. And of course, uh, and then he went down to Antioch. So he will have taken the road to Antioch after that. So we could talk a lot about uh, the issue of, you know, is, is Jerusalem, is the temple still there? And uh, is, it, is it still a factor? Do you still do the sacrifices? Do you, do you still go to the feasts? So forth. Uh, the, this is, this is uh, open to debate. He, he has gone there, and in fact, he will go back there again and have a very different experience. It may well be that he was incognito, uh, and uh, so nobody had really uh, known that he was there. But anyway, he comes back to Antioch, which is his home church, basically. Uh, but he hasn't been back there in almost two years. And uh, after spending some time there, he departed and went from one place to the next through the region of Galatia and Phrygia. Now that's uh, in uh, the what is now eastern, eastern Turkey. It was known as Asia Minor. And this is where he visited on his first uh, journey, first and second journey. And it says, to strengthen all the disciples. So I wanted to pause here and ask the question, how do you strengthen disciples? You go in and say, all right, let's be strong, guys, okay? <laughs> I mean, how, how is it done? And I believe... Uh, very, very simply, of course it's not a simple process, but very simply, you educate them in the Word. And I picked three things uh, that uh, 
come to mind that I would that I would want people to know, and uh, you can you can surely disagree with me if you like, or you can. But there are lots of other things. But I'd like to first go go to uh, Proverbs two. Proverbs chapter two. And starting in uh, verse 1. My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding, yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth, for if the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity, guarding the paths of justice and watching over the way of his saints. Then you will understand righteousness and justice and equity in every good path. For wisdom will come into your heart, and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. So while there are elements of wisdom in many parts, absolute wisdom, and the wisdom which will work on your inner parts, only come from one place, God. Okay, The wisdom of man will always be sullied in some way. Okay, And then further... If you were to go to James chapter 1, verse 5, it says, God gives it freely. Not that they had that text at that time. But I would want them to know that the source, the, the source of wisdom is God, and he is generous with it. And that's where they should go to get it. Now in Psalm 50... Psalm 50, verse 16. It's the Lord says, but, the, but to the wicked God says, What right have you to recite my statutes, or to take my covenant on your lips? For you hate discipline, and you cast my words behind you. If you see a thief, you are pleased with him, if you keep, you keep, and you keep company with adulterers. You give your mouth free rein for evil, and your tongue frames conceit, deceit. You sit and speak against your brother. You slander your own mother's son. These things you have done, and I have been silent. You thought that I was one like yourself. Now I, but now I rebuke you and lay the charge before you. Mark this then, you who forget God, lest I tear you apart and there be none to deliver. The one who offers thanksgiving as his sacrifice glorifies me. The one who orders his way rightly, I will sure the, show the salvation of God. I don't know how, how you pick it up. Because, I mean, it, it's a concept that's long been inside of me. I can't even remember where it happened. But I imagine that, that, there, that there was a time when I was confused by what appeared to be holy but was not. And what was God's attitude to people who did all the right things from, from, a, from a liturgical standpoint uh, and uh, attended all the feasts and so forth, but how, who had a rubbish, a rubbish life, a sinful existence? And here we see it. Uh, God has said that he has remained silent. You may have asked, why are you silent, Lord? Why don't you do something about these people? I think this is a, p a key piece of wisdom for new believers to understand where God is with this thing. I mean, there are lots and lots of things. I mean, the, the prophets and all of the predictions that were made about Christ, but of course they've done those already in their, in, in their walk. Uh, and then, uh, f finally, uh, John 16, 
uh, not because they had John 16, but because this will have been become, become part of the, the oral gospel that is being given to them, surely. John 16, verse 18. Uh, so they were saying, what does he mean by a little while? Wait a minute. I think that I've got my... I think that, oh dear. wonder if I got, I have this wrong, and I thought I checked it last <coughs> night. Oh no, here we go. It's 15, not 16. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as it, its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, if you, they kept my word, they would also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to him, they would not have been guilty of sin. Sorry, I wanted to stop at 21. It's, it's helpful, it's vital to know that Christ predicted the enmity and the persecution, the dichotomy between the kingdom and the world. And so this is, these are one of the, some of the things that I would want to do if I was strengthening the disciples. So now we uh, come to a new player, a new, a new uh, person uh, in uh, the story, a man called Apollos. In verse 24 of Acts 18, it says, Now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. The King James says, um, mighty in the scriptures. Now this is uh, this is the key to his uh, his recommendation, mighty in the scriptures. You know the Lord laid it on the line. He was the one who said, "If you knew Moses, you'd know me." He laid it on the line that if you if you study the Tanakh, if you really study the Tanakh, and not just fiddle about with certain pieces of it and then do a lot of work with uh, man's writing in the, in the Talmud and the, and the Mishnah. Uh, if, you, if you study the Tanakh, you will come to know Christ. And I do believe, I do believe that, that, uh, that the Holy Spirit on, would honor that study. It's an, it's an, ex, an enormous thing. I really believe that the, 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 the rabbis don't know the scriptures. They know the traditions, but they don't know the scriptures. Uh, if you watch these One for Israel uh, things, uh, if any of you have seen them, these are the uh, Jews who have come to Christ. And uh, uh, easily 80% of them uh, did it by going back, to, going to the Tanakh. They, they followed the Tanakh, and then they fell into Matthew and that the deal was done. So, uh, him being mighty in the scriptures is huge. Now, he had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. I would caution you about translations which use the word 
Lord in the second sentence. Uh, uh, the, he had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in the spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus because in the original text, uh, these are two different words. So, so uh, it, it's, it's specifically, it says Yeshua uh, in the second sentence of confirming that this is Yeshua in the first sentence, okay? Because those can be used interchangeably, but Yeshua can't. So, uh, though he knew only the baptism of John, and it says he spoke accurately about Jesus, but then John, John spoke accurately about Jesus. But John, did John know the whole plan? Okay, not sure. Uh, he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more <laughs> accurately. So we're not told what was missing in his understanding. But we're told afterwards that it, he, he gets it sorted out. So there are a couple of really good principles here. Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside. They took him privately. This is so important. I make a silly statement. This is the silly statement. The contrast between the experience of the stabber and the stabby is profound. All the stabber experiences is a slight pressure in his hand. The stabby is ruptured and dies. Okay. And the thing is that if you had true empathy, you would never stab anybody. There is a lack of empathy or, a, or some, something that, that is, uh, I shouldn't say that empathy would sort it out because, of course, there's lots of motives for doing something dreadful like that. But we have to remember that if we are going to correct somebody, it's going to be a very different experience for them being corrected than it is for us doing the correcting. It's easy for us. It can be very painful for them. And to do it in public is unconscionable. And I have heard it. I remember a young man came to, we were in a uh, Plymouth Brethren Assembly where you have uh, open service where people can get up and speak. The man can get up and speak. Uh, and uh, it's supposed to be moving towards uh, the breaking of bread, uh, the bread and the cup. And so there are the old Stoics who won't mention anything else other than that. But this guy got up and he started speaking and he was, he was actually seminary trained. What he was saying was good, but it wasn't particularly relevant to what we were doing. But, you know, you just, uh, they catch on after a while and, and that's okay. He sat down and this guy came up, bopped up and, and said, we're here to remember the Lord, okay? And, and so here he delivered the knife. Just a little pressure in his hand, but a, but a mortal wound in the hand of the other person. We have to be so careful. Fortunately, he died fairly soon and after that <laughs> and uh, didn't do it to anybody else, okay? <laughs> you don't want your death to be a fortunate experience in the church, okay? I mean, I think we've, I, I know most of us have been guilty in some respect in this. It's just most important. We see the quality here in Priscilla and Aquila. I mean, it's, these, these people are the, are the, the real thing. And they, they, did, they did a wonderful job with him. And then he wished to go across to Achaia. Uh, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. When he arrived, he greatly helped those who through grace had believed, for he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that Christ, the Christ was Jesus. So another powerful uh, force has been added to the work that is going on. These two long stays in these big cities, Ephesus was a very big city, 
they had a they had a stadium or a, or a, a theater or something that held twenty five thousand people, twenty five thousand people. It was a a rich town, rich city, and so of course was Corinth. And what's happening in all of these places is that people are coming and going, and the gospel is being spread by people who are hearing the truth and coming to Christ, then going out back out to their towns. It's a, a strategy. You see the strategy. There's one on the Greek side and one on the Asia side, and these two towns are going to cr uh, are going to be the source of so much spreading of the truth. And of course, we do see that he went to Corinth, and of course there were some people who got the wrong idea and thought they should be of Apollos and not of Paul, and there was a, a factionalized uh, the church, and you, we see in the letter later, but praise God that the, the gospel is being preached. So, just like to sum up, that here we have, uh, here we have Paul taking a break, going uh, to Jerusalem, and the Lord has plans for this man Apollos. He was from Alexandria. He's obviously educated. He's eloquent. He's uh, ready to work. He's determined. Where does he send him? He sends him to a place where there are a little, little couple who uh, will be able to straighten him out on, uh, on the, the exact nature of the gospel so that he can do, go ahead and, and get the work done and be a part of this uh, wonderful spreading of the truth. So here God is just arranging these little meetings, isn't he? You can still just see his hand throughout this stuff as we've seen so many times already in Acts. I've never read Acts before in this way. I've always just plowed through it. I've never I realized how many of these rendezvous that he sets up and seen his, his power and his care through the whole thing. More to come, obviously, along with the riot and all sorts of things. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, uh, for your word and for your encouragement. And thank you, Lord, uh, for this body that meets here in your name, that encourages and strengthens itself through your word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs>